Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Full work limited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to. Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. <gasps> No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination, to the fear you can hear. There is a green land called the Emerald Isle, where stardust dapples shining lakes that sparkle against blue mountains which fall away to winding bays. But there are darker sides to Ireland, currents that run deep, a wasting, bitter civil war in the north, and everywhere, lurking behind the shamrock and beneath the laughter, a dark world of legend, of banshees and warlocks, of voices on the wind against which the traveler should stop his ears, or the sound of the death bell. Our mystery drama, The Death Bell, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin, and stars Michael Tolan. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Hello, this is Goldilocks. It seems like only yesterday that I was a little girl tasting porridge. You know, this one's too hot. This one's too cold. And now I conduct taste tests on diet drinks. And there's one I must tell you about. Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. It has a fresh, natural, delicious taste. It drives my taste meter crazy. Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. <gasps> this one's just right. Computers, we're big on that. You deserve an airline that remembers your name. Ozark's computer helps us not to forget your name, reservation, connections, your return plans. At Ozark, a big and personal computer helps us deal more personally with you. Computers, we're big on that at Ozark Airlines. Now go Ozark's evening jet at 6.45 to Washington with through service to Champaign-Urbana and Peoria. Since time immemorial, man has sought to trace the future in the lines of the palm. The best answer always is, if you truly believe. As in spite of herself, it would appear that Sheila Doyle does. The moment I clapped eyes on Denny's cousin from the States, Brian Markham, there was a bogle tugging at my skirts. And the one look in his hand ran the blood in me cold. For I never saw a shadow plainer. Brian? Hmm? Oh, yeah, yes, Denny. Well, what are you doing over by the window? I'm trying to see where that bell came from. What bell? It's been ringing ever since you went up with Sheila, don't you? Well, that's funny. What? It stopped. You didn't hear it? Nope. Well, maybe you're just used to it. D don't you have some kind of a bell around here? Well, uh, the church? No, no, not a church bell. Something much smaller, like, uh, on an animal, maybe. Well, there aren't any animals around. Oh, 
<laughs> well, maybe I'm just hearing things after that scare Sheila threw into Oh, me. look, Brian, I'm sorry about that. Sheila, well, Sheila's as level-headed as they come about everything except some of the old country superstitions. <laughs> she wasn't kidding, you know. She really believes in a lot of this. Well, forget it, Denny. I'm not worried about me. I was only concerned about Sheila. She looked all shook up. Oh, she was embarrassed. I think she felt she'd made a fool of herself. <laughs> I don't think she'll be able to face you again tonight, but by morning, she'll cook you a breakfast that'll stick to your ribs. <laughs> you are going to stay, huh? Oh, I can take the car and run down to the local inn. No, right? sir. No, sir. Not on your life. My cousin comes all the way from the States. I don't let you get away till we do some catching up. Catching up? Yes. I want to hear all about your wife. My wife? Yes. Sheila and I are so sorry she didn't come along with you. She, uh... She wasn't feeling herself at the last moment. Yes, I know. So you said. You see, this isn't so much a trip. It's more a sort of pilgrimage. A what? I want to find Carrie Kleiner. I want to see it for myself. If it exists. What do you mean? Well, Brian, I always understood it was just a, a family legend. You mean to say you've been here in Ireland now for three years and you haven't tried to look it up? Man, it's near 250 miles from here and I haven't a car. Anyways, it wasn't my side of the family. Well, it was mine. Or should have been. At the very least, from my mother's side. You know that. Well, I honestly don't. All I know is that my mother used to ramble on when she got older about how there was royalty in the blood somewhere far back and the ancestors lived in a castle in the north. Carrig Kleiner. It was a castle. Huh? The Carrigs were said to be in the direct line of descent from Brian Boru himself. And it was a family custom to name the residence for the family name and for the wife who reigned over it. My great-great-grandmother, Kleiner, was married to the last of the line, Lord Carrig. Your great-great-grandfather? That's one of the things I'd like to find out. See, I think he was. You think? Lord Carrig didn't. He killed Kleiner and threw the man he said was her lover from the balcony over the sea to be smashed to death on the rocks below. And he sent my great-grandfather to be brought up by his wife's family, the Mackins. Your great-grandfather? You mean Carrig's son? He refused to recognize him. Claimed he was illegitimate. I see, I see. Well, now, look. Looking for an old lost castle is as good a way as any of spending a vacation. You'll get a chance to see a good bit of Ireland on the way. Now, come on. Let's go get your bag out of the car and I'll show you to your room. For the first time in our marriage, I found myself getting a little annoyed with Sheila as I walked Brian to the car. There was that vague kind of family connection between us, you write off as cousins, but mostly what we were was old friends and classmates. Now, with Sheila's superstitions jogging my imagination, I was uh, uneasy with Brian. A feeling, thank the Lord, that a few minutes in the soft Irish night blew away. Oh, it's good to be alive on a night like this. Mm. It makes me think of... What, Brian? Commencement. The end of the term, anyway. <laughs> or, or after the last ball game of the season. Tired, but loose, you remember? Well, for pitchers, maybe. Catchers with old football knees took longer to unwind. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, how's the old rat race? Advertising? Oh, it still goes round and round. Hamsters on a cage wheel. How's the writing? Slow, slow, but sure. And I make an honest buck cutting peat to keep myself in shape. You're a happy man. Oh, what more could I ask for? Wait till you see your namesake tomorrow. Little Brian. How soon will he be two? About the time his little sister comes to join him. Six months or so. Oh, hey, you're having another? Yes. Well, that's... That's solid, man. It's solid. Well, you know I always like kids. Nothing like having your own, though. And how about you, senior citizen? <laughs> what does that mean? Well, you have been married longer than Sheila and me. When are you and Gloria going to have yours? As a matter of fact, Gloria got pregnant seven months ago. Oh, and you're trying to keep it secret. So that's why she didn't come along, huh? That's one of the reasons. Uh, but come on, I can't keep you away from your wife any longer. Here, just let me get my gear and we can hit the sack. Oh, there's no hurry, no hurry. For my money, we could sit up all night and shoot the breeze. Well, that'd suit me if I didn't have a, a long journey ahead of me tomorrow. Oh, I see. You're still determined to go chasing rainbows. <laughs> I heard the door close when they left the house and had gone to the window to watch Denny and Brian talk at the car. I couldn't hear the words. 
but at least Brian's arm slung around any shoulder eased my mind enough to make me go to bed. Still and all, even with the soothing sound of their voices rumbling below and their laughter, it was long before I fell into an uneasy sleep. Oh, I... Danny? Oh, I'm sorry. Shh, Sheila, shh. Darling, go to sleep. It's all right. I was half on to waking. Turn the light on. No need, no need. I'm all undressed. Just come into bed. And did you get Brian settled? Ah, yes. He, he's snoring already. By the time I closed up and looked in on little Brian, he was dead to the world. Darling, what's wrong? Hmm? You shivered. Oh, it was maybe a hair limped over my grave. Ah. Hold me. Hmm? Who needs to be asked? Sheila, you're wrong about Brian. What way? We've had a long talk, just like old times. I, I never felt closer to him. Well, I know you've missed him since you came away here. We were always more like brothers than cousins. Well, I'm not saying he isn't tense and all wound up, but that's old stuff to me, Akushla. Oh, you're making to be a real Irishman again. <laughs> well, next to you because of you, and grateful I am. <laughs> Are you for real, Danny? Don't you know? Oh, Sheila... I used to be all tied up in knots like Brian, and that's all it is, you see. Well, I hope you're right. You haven't heard the best news yet. What? Well, you're not the only one that's carrying a heart beneath your own. Gloria's expecting. Brian's wife? When? Before you. That's why she didn't come along this trip. Well, that's good news, Denny. I want to be happy for your friend, your cousin, your, your brother, almost. Well, so you can be, you can be. <sighs> Sheila... Hmm. What did you think you saw in Brian's palm? Don't ask me. First of all, because I have no words to tell you. And second, I'm praying to sweet Mary to forgive me. For I'm hoping it was himself who's only giving me a warning not to meddle in the Lord's business. The night is quiet outside. Except for the tinkle of that far-off bell... There's a kind of peace. I had to stop here with Denny. Touch normal life, if only for a moment. I will not think back. And tomorrow must wait till I find it. I know what it will bring to so many people. I wonder what it will bring to me. Brian Mackin. The last thing I hear is the bell. Lulling me to sleep. <laughs> Well, that does it. All set for the road. Oh, I wish you didn't have to go so soon. So do I. Will you stop by then to see us on your way back? I, I don't know if I'll be coming this way, Sheila. Oh, try. Try to make it. And, and Brian. Yes? The farther north you get, particularly beyond Sligo, hug the coastline all the way. Please, don't go near the border. Ulster, you mean? There's still a lot of trouble. I wish you'd forget the whole thing. Except I won't. Well, man, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And if there ever was a Carrie Clayna, it's, it's probably nothing but ruins by now. If there ever was one, I'll find it. And I think I will. And if you should, what would it prove? I, I don't know. Goodbye, Brian. Come again. I'll try. Bye, Denny, old pal. I'll only say au revoir. And it's glad I am to have met you. And, and forgive me for last night. The gypsy's warning? I don't know what came over me. Think nothing of it. Well, so long, shaman. Drive carefully. I hope you had a good night's sleep. With the good company and the good air? What else? Even the little bell I finally got used to. And off I went like a log. <laughs> so here goes. Hail and farewell. What was that about a bell, Denny? Oh, search me, my morning. When I came downstairs last night after I took you up to bed, Brian was by the window. He insisted he could hear a little bell ringing somewhere, but <laughs> I couldn't hear it. What kind of a bell was that? Like it was on an animal, he said. Not like a cow, but more, say, like a, like a goat. The Lord and all his saints be praised. No, no. What is it, she? We should call him back. He should get out of Ireland. Oh, what are you getting all riled up about now, I honey? I told you he was holding the shadow of death in his palm. Now I know I made no mistake. There's no bell in this town he could have heard, like you said. Except one. What? What? The one that's only heard by him it sounds for. And I know it for sure. Twas the death bell. <laughs>
Is Brian Mackin really marked for death? And if so, how soon? And how? We will return shortly with Act Two. Some beer drinkers have funny ideas about beer. They think beer improves with age, like wine. Well, find a brewmaster, though. You'll find a beer drinker who knows better. The Budweiser brewmaster says it all depends on how beer is aged. Just letting beer sit in lagering tanks makes it older, not necessarily better. That even goes for keeping a case around the house for a couple of months. But there is one kind of aging that's good for beer. The Budweiser kind. Beechwood aging. In this kind of aging, something happens. It lets all the flavor of the choicest hops and best barley malt that go into Budweiser get through to you. Sure, it takes more time and trouble to brew Budweiser that way. But brewing beer right does make a difference. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Hey, ma'am, what's for dinner? Hey, ma'am, what you got? It's time to get ready for the great outdoors, and your ShopRite supermarket has everything you'll need for cookout dinners and fun in the sun. And for this week's dinners, ShopRite is featuring whole grade-A frying chickens, just 37 cents a pound. Roasting chickens, up to four pounds, 47 cents a pound. Choice beef rib steaks, $1.19 a pound. ShopRite Franks, just 89 cents a pound. Get all your outdoor cooking equipment and many great food values at your ShopRite supermarket this week. She loves the family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets ShopRite do the rest. Hey, my, what's for dinner? ShopRite has the answer. Two hundred and fifty miles is a short day's drive, as we reckon it, in the good old U.S. of A. But through the length of Ireland, stopping more and more in the last fifty miles to ask the still unanswered question, do you know of a castle in these parts called Carrickplana? It's a long, long trip that at last has brought Brian Mackin to a little bridge across a valley stream. Stopping there to eat the lunch Sheila put up for him before he left, he has scarcely finished it as twilight falls. Then, as he dozes for a moment, back against a tree... Help! Help! Uh, what? Pull him up! Pull him up! I can't! Throw him! Hold on! Hold on! Don't get thrown! Oh, boy! Oh, easy! Easy! Hold up there! Hold there! Hold there! Hold up! All right. Easy, boy. Easy. All right. All right. Are you... You all right, ma'am? Yes, and I'm much beholden to you, sir. Oh, it's my pleasure. What what happened? Well, something frightened my horse. I I lost control. May I have the reins, sir? All right, now, stay, boy, stay. There, here you are. Oh, thank you, Mr. Uh... Brian Mackin. How do you do? I am the Lady Clayna Carrick. What? I said I'm Lady Carrick. Of Carrick Clayna? Well, naturally. <laughs> then it does exist. I should hope so. I was just on my way home. Where? Where is it? Just across the bridge and over the hill. Oh, now that I've regained my composure. On my soul, you do look familiar. I didn't catch your name. Brian. Brian Mackin. Oh, no. No. You must be mad to try to intercept me here. Run, Brian. Run for your life. Reach him. Get. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, my lady. If you value your life... Stay away from me! I am frozen at her sudden flight. Then suddenly I find myself running after her, laboring for breath over the last burst to the crest of the hill. Oh, oh, damn, the light going. But but where? Where? She she couldn't have just disappeared into, into thin air. But she had. In the lowering darkness, I can see the long sweep of the countryside down to the rocks and sea cliffs. And there is no sign of horse or rider, or of any destination they might be bound for, nor any road for a horse to follow, much less my modern car. For the moment, I realize I must return to my car and seek some lodging for the night.
Danny. Is that you? Well, who else were you expecting, Sheila? Oh, darling, I'm that glad to see you. Uh -huh. It's late, you are. Oh, we cut a few extra squares tonight as long as the light was with us. Here, here, what is it, little bird? You're all aflutter. It's Brian's on my mind. Oh, you'll laugh at me again, I suppose. But as I was laying our little one down with the sun just gone over the hill, I thought I heard him calling, Clayna, Clayna. Oh, now, Sheila, I... <laughs> what's got into you? I wish I knew. I only know somehow we should never have let Brian go off for the north. Something terrible is going to happen to him. And if there is, what could we do to stop well, it? Well, we should try. Would you have me follow him on Shank's mare? How fast do you think I could walk it? Well, you could borrow the McFadden's car or Seamus' motorcycle. And if I did, where would I head for? Oh, don't fault me, darling, or make me the fool. It's just a feeling comes over me and I can't help it. I'm, I, I want to be wrong. I oh, hope she, I'm wrong. Sheila, I... now please, please, stop worrying about Brian. If anyone ever knew how to take care of himself, that's the guy. I said it with authority because I meant it, or I thought I meant it. Or I tried to mean it because I wanted to reassure Sheila. The truth is, I was shaken again. I'd been three years living in Ireland, long enough to fall under all of her spells, even the black ones. And I'd have given anything to know where Brian was at at that moment. And what he was doing. Excuse me, gentlemen. Sorry. Closing time is posted. I wasn't... Uh, I wasn't looking for a drink as much as I was for accommodations tonight. Where now... As to that... I'm willing to pay well for it. An American, is it? Well, for that much, I suppose we could be after finding your room and a bite to soup. And perhaps a little information? We're not for doing much talking around these parts, in particular to strangers. What would you want to know? Well, something very simple, I hope. Would either of you know where I could find a place called Carrie Kleiner? Carrie Kleiner? Yes, no. What would be after bringing it to these parts looking for the likes of Carrie Cleaner? Well, till late this afternoon, only a dim hope of finding it after all these years. For private reasons. Oh, and what would the private reasons be? Family ones. My great-grandfather was born there. Who uh, was he now? And what was it that late this afternoon gave you the good hope of finding Carrie Cleaner? I ran into someone who lives there. Who lives there? Patty. Will you hold your tongue, Mick? And uh, who would you have met that said they was from the castle? A very beautiful woman. A girl, actually, who said she was the Lady Clayna Carey. Oh, the Lord and his saints preserve us. The Lady Clayna. Uh, where was this then? Well, about five miles or so north of here. There's a road goes winding down to a little bridge and then goes up a rise on the other side, but sort of... Sort of peters out. Ah, oh, that's the old Bali Brig across the Scalinor. Did you drive your car across that bridge? No, I stopped this side of it because the going was getting so rough. Sure, it's lucky you didn't drive on it. It might have carried away with you. That bridge has been condemned for anything but foot travel as long as I can remember. But why? Because it doesn't lead to anywhere anymore. It leads to Carrie Kleiner somehow. How would you know that? Because the lady was bound for there on her horse. Ah, huh? Was it a big bay mare with a mane as white as snow? Yes, that, that's the one. And the woman? How was she dressed? Why, she, uh... She was in sort of a green velvet dress with a big hat. Like an old-fashioned riding habit, you'd say. Oh, Mary bless us. And the good Lord save us all. Old-fashioned it is for sure. For well, the Lady Cleaner has been dead these hundred years and more. No, no, this, this was a young woman. She was only past her 21st year when she died... That was no real woman you saw this afternoon, stranger. That was her ghost. But I talked to her. Did you now, then? What you saw was never real. And you can take that as gospel. Well, perhaps. I, I hadn't eaten all day, and I did take a nap under a tree. Mm, and it was twilight, when all fancies begin. We'll let it go at that, anyway. But... Carrie Cleaner, is that just fancy, too? Oh, well, no, as to that... Must you but... always put your oar in, Mick? I'm talking to the gentleman here, Mr... Mackin. Uh... Brian Mackin. It is a good Irish name. I mentioned that my family came from Ireland. Mm, so you did. And at least you've had the sense God gave you to come back. 
I'm Paddy Flynn, and the little runt here is Mickey Mahan. Uh, the top of the evening to you. Is it back you are to stay, Mr. Markin? That depends on what I find at Carrie Kleiner. Uh, it's little you'll find there. Deserted and empty and blown by the winds for a century. It's not but a ruin. Not worth the effort to go by it. And sometimes at nightfall, there's a woman's voice that'll call, Come away! Come away! And he'll betide the man who listens. Well, just the same, I want to see Carrie Kleiner. Can you guide me there? Not by night. I wouldn't stir out by night for all the gold in a leprechaun's hoard. Maybe tomorrow. We'll see. Yeah, it's time we were all to bed. Come. I'll show you your room, Mr. Mackin. think he's from the police. I don't think so, but I'm taking the chances. Sure, and what are you doing there? I'm making Mr. Mackin a little nightcap as he requested. Only it will be a little stronger than he expected. Ah, uh, how is that, Paddy? Sure, I'm giving him a little extra dividend. Uh, your, your namesake, as you might say. But who will that be at all? Mickey... Pin. Oh, he never heard tell of him. Well, now, that's because he emigrated to Chicago, USA, long before your time and mine. Uh, but he gave his name to what's in this little bottle here. Oh, it looks like no more than bog water. Uh, it'll make you sleep a deal sounder. Now then, you'll take this drink up to him whilst I go arrange for the truck. It is a good thing we have a full moon to work with this night. To work? Isn't it obvious the guns are no longer safe at Carrie Cleaner? We'll have to have them up and away over the border by morning before our American gets to nosing about. Wish we're not going by the castle by the dead of night. How else? But she'll be walking again by the full moon. You heard Mr. Mackin saw her abroad in scarce before dark. What kind of soldier are you, Mick, that starts at shadows? Now, let's have no more nonsense out of you. And away up with a drink to Mr. Mackin. I look at my watch. It's just after midnight. The nightcap is untasted on the table beside my bed. I don't trust it. I don't trust a lot of things. But where to get rid of it? A vagrant memory drifts across my mind of jokes among old country people. A quick look under the bed, and there is the receptacle. It's a matter of a moment to empty the glass in it. And none too soon. I can hear stealthy footsteps approaching. Don't use the cash, Mick. Unless there's trouble. If there is, I'll put him to sleep myself. Mr. Mackin? Mr. Mackin? I think he's away. Follow me. Ah, he's dead to the world. We'll check that out. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. Ch -ch -ch -chumba. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Ch -ch -ch -chumba. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Full work limited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. He's drunk it. Will it keep him quiet long enough? Well, eight to ten hours. And even when he wakes, he'll not want to leave his bed. Now come away, man. We've much to do. Lying on my bed, snoring, pretending to be asleep, I have listened to everything. But the fall of that heavy lock tells me once and for all, I am a prisoner. But as I wait for them to leave the house... I know that nothing will keep me from Carrie Kleiner. I have an appointment there that's been waiting a hundred years. And even now, in the still of the night, I can hear the far-off tinkle of that bell and a voice crying. Come away! Run! Come away! Back to Carrie Kleiner! I will return shortly with Act Three.
I stand by the window, carefully on the side where the moonlight cannot cast my shadow, and watch the courtyard of the inn below. A small truck like a weapons carrier is there, and Patty and Mick climb into it. In a moment, it has gone to a destination I can only guess. By the time I am out the window, clambering to the courtyard and into my car, there is no hope of following. Particularly when I find my distributor cap gone and my car useless. It's a long, agonizing walk for five miles, even on a moonlit night. And by the time I have crossed the bridge and climbed to the ridge above, I am at the ragged edge of exhaustion. But there is a reward. Far below, against the restless sea, there are pinpoints of light that move. I am near the end of my pilgrimage, and the bell is sounding again. Danny. Danny. Uh, uh, what, what is it, Sheila? The phone. It's ringing. Well, what time is it? It's half past three in the morning. Well, who could be calling us I now? I don't know. I have been lying here awake, afraid that something was about to happen. Will you go down now and answer it, or shall I? All right, all right. I'm on my way, but who? It's Brian. Or something about him. And whatever it is, no bell that rings in the night brings anything but ill luck. <laughs> At the last after me. Not by a long shot. And damn the moon. It's off away behind the clouds again. I wish I was off away with it. What's the matter, Mick? Are you afraid a banshee will howl you off to your grave? Well, there's little I like at all about this night. We're all stretching our necks across the gibbet one way or the other. Well, the sooner we deliver these guns over the border, the safer we'll be. I wish now I'd stood away with a ship that delivered them three days ago. And I'd be out of this in the way home. Well, you didn't. So let's have at it and get them away from the storehouse before... Wait a minute. Ah, what is it? By the ridge there. The silhouette of a man. Let's get the truck away and hidden around to the seaward side. Hey, you take it. Give me that cush of yours, and I'll handle whatever comes this way. Uh, yes, Sergeant, he was. Well, he left this morning, I mean yesterday morning, about nine. All I know is he was headed somewhere north of Sligo, Galway Bay area. Yes, he was looking for a place named Carrig Clayner. No, 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 not at all. And please, he's a, he's a cousin of mine and a, and, and a very good friend. You will keep us notified and let us know what's happening. Yes, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. What is it, Denny? Oh, what are you doing out of bed, Sheila? Who was on the phone? You said Sergeant. It was Liam Flaherty of the police. Oh, Sheila, that's all hell to pay. Tell me. There was a tracer from the States. They called the local here to get in touch with us. Why? The police in America. They're trying to get in touch with Brian. What has Brian done? That isn't the point. It's what's been done to him. What? Brace yourself, my darling. Somebody murdered his wife. A moment ago, on my way down the hill... I could see Carrie Clayna full in the moon. What do they mean? It's a ruin. It was just as I pictured it. Turrets, mullioned windows with diamond-shaped glass panes, great oak doors, and ivied granite. Now with the moon hidden, its silhouette looms over me, reaching out to me as I come home at... <coughs> oh, oh. Oh, you didn't have to hit him so hard. I wasn't taking any chances with Mr. Mackin this time. Ah, is that who it is? Say for yourself. How do you get over the drink and away and here? No time to worry about that now. You think he is police or maybe the British? Whatever he is, we'll decide that later. Let's get the guns off and away first. I'm standing in front of the great door of Kelly Kleiner. And I know that everything's going to come clear at long last. I reach out and pull the bell. Even the bell is familiar, although I cannot quite place where I've heard it before. And now, the door is opening. Good evening, Brian. We've been waiting for you. Good evening, Your Lordship. I'm sorry I'm late. No matter. We've but just finished dinner. And her ladyship is with, uh, the child. 
Will you join me in a glass of mulled wine? At your pleasure. I've not seen you for some time, and... Uh... Ah, the devil. I forgot. I must catch my sea captain before he leaves to send some packets. Will you forgive me? I should not be over two hours or so. Uh, may I hope you'll attend me, lady, in my absence? I should be happy to, except... Would you not rather I transmit the packages for you on my way home? No. I must have certain words with the shipmaster that I alone can bring. Besides, I would not deprive Clayner of some outside companionship. We're so isolated here, it would be cruel to deny her a new face to brighten her solitude. The hour is late, perhaps. It would be better... No, no, I won't hear of it. You shall be our guest for the night, and I shall be back post-haste. I'll try to make it in as close to two hours as possible. Meanwhile, make yourself completely at home. I am in a dream, I suppose. For by my host's clothes, the speech, a calendar I find on the wall, I am back in the past over a hundred years. But more important, I am within the walls of Carrie Clayner, and the riddle of my whole life, I feel, is near to being solved. When Lord Carrie leaves, I am too impatient to wait for my answers. So I climb the great staircase to Clayner's bedroom and knock on the door. Who is it? Brian. A moment. What are you doing here? I grew tired of waiting for you to come down. My husband, he's... Lord Carrick has ridden to town. It will be two hours before he returns. May I come in? I shouldn't let you. It's too late. I... I thought you'd left for good two years ago. When I lost you to him, I meant to. But for a while, I stayed hiding in the fen. Oh, I know you were seen... Do you know what you've done to me? And why do you come back now? I wanted to see the boy. By what right? He... Is he mine, Kleiner? I have to know. Is he mine? No. You called him by my name. It was a foolish choice. Why? Because I loved you. And now? Oh, Brian. The years have come and gone. Lord Carrick is my husband and the father of my child. And I have a whole new life I've learned to accept. I... I still want to know if the child is mine. Let me go. When you answer me. How could he be yours? He, he was born ten months after I married Lord Carrick. Then why does everyone whisper he's mine? Because you didn't leave as you promised. Why didn't you take yourself right out of my life? But there was nothing between us after your marriage. We know that, but no one else believes it. They still think the child is mine. Even Lord Carrick? I can't imagine why he could have welcomed you here tonight. I can't tell you how he... Wait a minute. What is it? Hush. Dear God, he's here. You'll kill me. Over my dead body. And here it is. The moment I've reached back through a century for. The one I want to change. It's today I want to bring back. And Gloria and my own child that I killed in one moment of anger and hate as Lord Carrick plans to do with me and Clayna now. I have only one chance of bringing Gloria back to change history or at least to set it right he's coming up the outside balcony stairs through the French windows run Brian he'll kill me if he finds you here I'll kill him first for doubting you oh, in heaven's name no Lord Carrick hold so once again you try to steal my wife put up your dagger I am unarmed so much the better you first and then my wife. This time, not so easily. I'm not the hunted, but the hunter. Look to yourself! He stands with his dagger half raised, frozen with inaction as I hurtle myself towards him, hands raised to shield and grapple and destroy him. But what I reach for is nothing but a shade. My outstretched hands grasp only air, and my hurtling body passing through his spectral waist crashes full tilt against the crumbling battlement, which gives way like powder. And of a sudden, just like the lover in the ancient legend, I am plummeting like today's skydiver towards the rocks below. And in this awful moment, I know that I was just as wrong about my wife Gloria as Lord Carrig was a hundred years ago about Plena. Small comfort now to know that I am legitimate as the rocks below rush up towards me like an express train... And I am no more. Ah. 
Are you ready, Sheila? In a moment. What is it, darling? But Belle, I don't know if I ever want to hear a bell in my life again. That's only the church bell. We didn't ever hear the other one. What happened to him, Denny? Oh, I'd have to be God to answer that. He snapped. The way a lot of us do when life spins us around too fast and curdles our brains. Why do you think I ran away from it all and... and came here to find peace? Brian really killed Gloria. He'd had a nervous breakdown two months ago. He escaped from the sanitarium. His obsession about paternity had put him there and Gloria was asking for a divorce. He lost his head. She lost her life. But how did he think he could escape by coming here? I don't think he was looking for escape, but... Oh, I know it's such a writer's word, but... Expiation. Are you saying, then, he was after taking his own life? We'll never know, Sheila. The police say there's some evidence that the IRA were using Carrie Kleiner as a depot for smuggled arms from the sea. Maybe he stumbled on them. The local folk would tell you that anyone in that haunted castle after dark, especially when the moon was full, was risking God knows what. And someone I know very dearly sensed he was marked by fate for death. Oh, don't. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Perhaps for Brian Mackin, it was the only way. Let's us go give him a decent burial. And wish him peace at last. tale. A tortured man who borrowed a century-old sorrow and carried it on his back like the old man of the sea. Small wonder he broke eventually under the senseless strain and ran amok. A man to be censured, but also to be pitied. A man for whom the death bell sounded. Let his epitaph be John Dunn's, lest you stop to criticize too harshly. Ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. I'll be back shortly. Oh, sure. You can talk about good-tasting diet drinks, but I know. I'm Goldilocks, and here at my taste-testing laboratory, I taste-test them all. And nobody's been drinking my diet drinks until I tested sugar-free Diet 7-Up. And then, kabloomy! Every bear wanted some. Diet 7-Up is fresh, natural, delicious. Sugar-free Diet 7-Up. This one's just right. North Jersey is certainly getting a higher yield this spring, especially with Suburban Savings Special High Yield Saving Certificate that you can raise for fun and profit. All you have to do is plant a modest $2,500 minimum in Suburban Limited Issue 7.50% Saving Certificate. Then put your certificate in a nice, safe place. Suburban takes care of the rest by compounding interest continuously from day of deposit paid quarterly. You'll get a nice, healthy 7.90% effective annual yield on your 7.50 saving certificate when you let it grow from 4 to 10 years. Early withdrawal prior to maturity is, of course, subject to a substantial penalty. So for a nice, healthy 7.90% annual effective yield, grow Suburban's 7.50% saving certificate for fun and profit at any Suburban savings office in Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, and Sparta. Our cast included Michael Tolan, Marion Seldes, William Redfield, and Guy Sorrell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... Theater program was furnished by the CBS Radio Network. This is Mary Helen McPhillips.
Growing old may not be fun, but the only choice is to die. So hopefully most of us will grow old. And how to do it well is what we'll be talking about at 10.15 tomorrow morning on the Martha Dean program. Morton Puner, a member of the Gerontological Society, will tell us what we know about growing old. I hope you'll join me tomorrow morning at 10.15. I'm Fulton Lewis in the Mutual Broadcasting System studios in Washington, D.C. Now, my commentary. President Nixon's Watergate lawyer said today that he's going to move to quash a Watergate prosecution subpoena for 64 more White House tapes. He would not say whether the president will abide by any adverse Supreme Court decision should that tape battle come to that. Facing a deadline of Thursday for responding to the subpoena from Special Prosecutor Leon Jaworski, the president's defense attorney, James St. Clair, held a broad-ranging news conference here in Washington today, a news conference in which he discussed the president's reasons for making public more than 1,200 pages of edited transcripts of the Watergate tapes. He also disclosed that the House Judiciary Committee is seeking more than 140 additional tapes for its impeachment inquiry. Discussing Jaworski's subpoena, St. Clair argued today that the massive public release of transcripts by the president yesterday strengthens his effort to have the subpoena quashed. He said he will move now on two grounds. First, in his words, especially now, clearly the prosecution must have enough evidence to proceed to try these cases. And knowing Mr. Jaworski, I am confident that he wouldn't have indicted these people if he didn't think he had enough evidence to convict them. Secondly, Acknowledging that the White House has a duty to make available materials that would be helpful to the defendants, St. Clair today said, everything we know of is in that book of transcripts. Everything is there. He also contended that there was a significant difference between the Jaworski subpoena and the one issued last year in the name of former Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox. He said the Cox subpoena, which led directly to the explosive firing of Cox, was on behalf of a federal grand jury, and the two court decisions that went against the president in that case were based on the proposition that the grand jury has sort of unique requirements. The Jaworski subpoena, on the other hand, St. Clair noted today, is aimed at providing materials for use in court trials rather than in grand jury deliberations. Asked whether the president would abide by an adverse Supreme Court decision should the Jaworski subpoena lead to a court fight and eventually reach the Supreme Court, St. Clair today said, quote, I wouldn't want to comment one way or the other because I have not discussed it with the president and I would not want to presume on his decision. In any case, he said, I don't believe that we will come to that. St. Clair also was asked to outline the strategic or tactical advantages that the president hoped to reap by making public the massive array of edited transcripts. He cited the following as the basic consideration, and I quote, People were getting more and more imbued with the idea that the president had something to hide to the extent that it endangered the presidency. The facts ought to be known, and then let's argue about them. The president's Watergate attorney, James St. Clair, today volunteered that the staff of the Judiciary Committee is seeking tapes of 141, 142, maybe, uh, those additional presidential conversations. He said he hoped the committee would take a second look at that request in light of Tuesday's disclosures and decide not to press it. Since most of these tapes are understood to deal with the controversies involving milk producers and the ITT, St. Clair was asked if he meant to suggest that the committees should forget those two issues. He said, based on what I know about it, the answer is yes. St. Clair made it apparent, however, that he is not opposed to providing additional materials relating to political contributions by the milk producers and the administration's controversial decision to raise milk price supports. He was asked if he felt that yesterday's disclosures might prejudice the cases of Watergate defendants that are still facing trial. St. Clair said, I do not think so, but as far as the conduct of the case is concerned, that is the first responsibility of the special prosecutor. Reminded that at one point in the bulky volume of transcripts, the president suggested to John Dean, who was then his private counsel, that witnesses in the Watergate proceedings might have conveniently faulty memories while under oath, St. Clair today said, as the president said, there are unfortunate remarks in there. Urging that the transcripts be looked at as a whole, he said the danger of this is to pick out a phrase here or a sentence there. The president's attorney also was asked if he thought it had been appropriate for the president to discuss at length payment of hush money to some Watergate defendants, as one transcript shows. St. Clair today responded, I'm sure if he had to do it all over again, he wouldn't have done that. 
The president is looking to the American people for vindication and vindication in the Watergate issue, while House impeachment investigators meet tonight to decide their next move in the quest for White House evidence. A majority of the House Judiciary Committee evidently was dissatisfied with the edited White House transcripts that the president delivered yesterday in lieu of tapes of those 42 presidential conversations that the committee had originally subpoenaed. The panel's Democratic majority planned to stop short of any formal demand for enforcement of the subpoena in favor of seeking bipartisan support for a simple statement declaring that the president had failed to comply with the subpoena. It was clear from the time that the president disclosed his transcript plan on Monday night that the support he sought was far beyond Capitol Hill, that his eventual goal was to try to persuade the American people that he did have no advanced knowledge of the Watergate break-in, that he had no knowledge of the cover-up of the Watergate issue, and that he was providing investigators with a full story of his role. For all of the 1,308 pages of presidential transcripts, there are nonetheless many uncertainties about just what the president did or did not know and when he knew it and what he intended to be done. It was, as the president's lawyers and the president himself had said, a document that is marked by ambiguities. One White House covering statement that was delivered with the transcripts declared, in all of the thousands of words spoken, even though they often are unclear and ambiguous, not once does it appear that the President of the United States was engaged in a criminal plot to obstruct justice. Those words also created a picture of a President feeling increasingly embattled and frustrated by a scandal, the disclosure of which he considered inevitable, but which he hoped to control, possibly even avoid. And they showed the president considerably, uh, considering many alternatives, many different options, including at one point the payment of some hush money to the original Watergate conspirators. The transcripts covered conversations between September 15th of 1972 and April 27th of 1973. There were a few critical meetings, though. There was one on September 15th of 1972. That was the day that the indictments were returned in the Watergate break-in case. On that day, the president met with White House counsel John Dean, who was later to become the president's chief accuser before the Senate Watergate Committee. There was another meeting on March 17th, 1973. That's the day that the president learned that members of the White House Plumbers Unit, set up to trace leaks of classified information, had engineered the break-in at the office of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist. There was a meeting just four days later, March 21st of 1973, that was the day the president said that John Dean first told him about the Watergate cover-up. Numerous alternatives, including meeting demands for hush money, were considered by the president, by John Dean, and by White House age, aides H.R. Haldeman and John Ehrlichman. Less than a month later, April 14, 1973, there was a meeting. That was the day of a rambling discussion of Watergate by the president, Haldeman and Ehrlichman, during which they talked about the need to fire John Dean, and the equally important need to convince former Attorney General John Mitchell to appear before the prosecutor and a grand jury. There were also a series of meetings in mid to late April 1973 during which the President learned more and more of the extent of the cover-up and the various progresses that were being made in the Watergate investigation. Those sessions climaxed with decisions to finally accept the resignations of Attorney General Richard Kleindienst, Haldeman, and Ehrlichman, and, of course, also the decision to fire John Dean. After voting to revise oil taxes, the House Ways and Means Committee is turning to general tax reform, but a personal income tax cut does not seem to be on the panel's present agenda for possible action. The committee was at work again today on a sweeping series of items, ranging from cutting Social Security taxes to reviewing tax shelters and tax treatment of capital gains, and from tax provisions for single people and married, married couples to tax simplification involving itemized deductions. Tax staff experts told newsmen following a closed-door committee meeting yesterday that the panel plans to consider this material in the next 60 days and may have to admit some of these items from the list but hopes to cover as many of these as possible. Missing from the listing of more than 25 topics, though, was a general personal income tax cut along the lines of a $5.9 billion measure that has been suggested by some members of the Senate. In the Senate, that body voted today to let states decide whether a motorist could buy group health insurance to cover accidental injuries. 
The action came as the Senate neared a final vote on no-fault automobile insurance, which would compensate accident victims without regard to who caused the accident. San Francisco Mayor Joseph Alioto announced today that police in his city have arrested seven black men in the so-called Zebra Street killings carried out by a black group, which in Alioto's words was dedicated to the murder and mutilation of whites and dissident blacks. He told a news conference... The police have pierced the veil of a vicious ring of murderers called the Death Angels. The Death Angels is kind of a reverse Ku Klux Klan. Twelve whites have been killed, six others wounded in San Francisco, in very random, very unprovoked attacks over the past six months. From the Mutual Broadcasting System studios in Washington, I'm Fulton Lewis, and that's the top of the news as it looks from here.